Okay, I'm going to throw to our first speaker, who <laughs> is Matthew Burke. Matthew is an Associate Professor, um, the Transport Academic Partnership Chair at the Griffith University's Cities Research Institute. He's presently leading projects on demand responsive transit, improved mode choice modelling, cashless payments for public transport, and tactical urbanism and cycling. Matthew's research interests include travel behaviour, transport and land use, transport policy, public transport and micromobility, i.e. walking and cycling. Um, so thank you, Matthew. And I'm going to throw to you literally, I think you can share your screen from where you are. Yes, hopefully. And we are in your hands and I'll ring a little bell at you when it's time okay. to start. <laughs> and you can see my screen now, hopefully. I've got confirmation. Yes, great. Okay, and it, hopefully this will work. Yep. All right. So I'm going to talk about built environments and then policy environments or policy changes we need to see to start getting somewhere meaningful with active transport in Australia. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the ACT a fair bit. I did live in your fair city for one year, um, but that was a long time ago. Uh, so. Um, as we, okay, this is not, let me just, come on, work, 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 resume. Okay, no, you don't need to know about me. Right, so first of all, what is active travel or active transport? Um, just definitions, this is the most used definition in the field of research. It's anything basically where you have to burn human calories to move your body. Um, uh, to propel it to get between an origin and a destination. So that's usually walking, cycling, but it does include e-bikes, particularly the e-bikes that are allowed under Australian legislation, the pedelecs as they're called, where you consume energy at a rate a bit more than walking, but less than standard bikes. Um, and it does include public transport in some definitions because most public transport journeys do include a walk or a cycle access trip stage, either at the end or the beginning of some description. And right, so let's go to the built environment first. And let's just remember that Australian cities in the main were built in the era before the motor car. Now, Canberra was a bit different. The Gold Coast is a bit different. They're the two largest cities that came a bit later. Uh, but generally, we a key feature of the Australian settlement is that we grew up decentralised. We never had the tenements and the apartment blocks of European or North American cities because the streetcars and the rail cars allowed suburbia to develop at a very early stage. And we went for motoring in a big way because it worked with that suburban fabric. And so as the motor car started to appear, particularly not just after we produced our own cars in the 1950s, but when petrol rationing was ended in 58. Um, mass motoring starts to appear. Our narrow streets don't work very well for um, the volume of cars that are coming. Traffic congestion becomes a problem. Now, these are cities without traffic lights, we might remember, in the 50s. Uh, but people are screaming, what do we do? What do we do? And we looked to planning guidance. And the planners of the time, the engineers of the time, looked to guidance from America and from particularly Great Britain. And this was from Great Britain. It was the Colin Buchanan report. This slide was actually reproduced in key Australian guidance on how to move forward with redesigning the city for the car. And isn't this such a beautiful city? We clean all the pedestrians and cyclists out of the way at grade level, and we give all the street space to cars who are now able to move freely and unfettered um, at vast speeds. Isn't that great? And we shove the pedestrians up onto urban obstacle courses up above on these walkways. And the city is so beautiful that you basically, looking at the city, there's what, what are the two options to do? Well, you can go to the bar on the right-hand side of the screen and drink yourself senseless because the city is so awful. Or you can go on a P&O cruise at the top of the screen 
and uh, get COVID-19 and go somewhere other than this city because that would be better than living in this city. But look, we adopted this advice. We thought it was a great thing to do. And so you don't have to go far in Australia to go and see sites where we adopted these principles. We created streets that are pretty much just for people to zing around at pretty high speeds. And by world standards, very high speeds, even on our local streets. And we create indoor realms for pedestrians to go along and go and visit shops and do activities. And then maybe some over ramps where they can walk into their car and then get in the car and drive in their garage and never actually experience the street. And that is the kind of landscape that we started to create. Now, Canberra actually resisted this in many ways. There were certain sub suburbs that were built on the Radburn design uh, and there were elements of this in, I think this is Gowan, um, some of the suburbs that were developed. Um, but at the same time, we were trying to wrestle with other problems of the car. One of those was rat running. So we created all these loop and lollipop designs so that cars would get lost and humans would get lost if they ever tried to walk uh, through this suburbia. And uh, these, these suburbs actually worked really well for a long time, especially as there was a, a primary school at the centre of each one. And each suburb was designed so that no child in the ACT had to walk uh, over an arterial road to get to a primary school. Of course, when you then shut half your primary schools in your city, you then mean half your children have to cross a big evil road and basically parents have to burn three litres of fuel to deliver their kids to school, um, which is the situation today. Congratulations, Canberra. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just those kind of things we, we, we redesigned for the car. This is Cameron offices in Belconnen, built as car-based offices, you know, with seas of car parking. That was how you were going to get there. And, of course, in other parts of Australia, we built the ultimate obesogenic environment. I mean, if you want to make people fat, this is how you build your cities. Um, the drive-in with the the footpath that noticeably disappears just as it approach, approaches the main road, forcing pedestrians to just throw themselves in front of cars. Um, and yes, you don't even have to get out of your SUV, you can just sit in there and then shove that chicken in your belly and get fat. And of course, in Canberra, we didn't just do car-based retail, we also did car-based politics. We're the only nation in the world whose um, capital is uh, uh, Parliament House is surrounded by a motorway that is used for motorsports events. Congratulations, Canberra. Um, and when we look at our neighbourhoods, we've built very homogenous neighbourhoods in Australian cities. By that I mean there's very little land use mixing. It's a deliberate strategy to inflate property prices because back in the 50s, you know, there were noxious industries in the inner city and you didn't want to live next to a tannery or a print shop or something noxious. Uh, these days, small businesses tend to have very little impact. And in fact, you know, um, some of the most desired places to live are like Fitzroy in the, you know, the centre of Melbourne, which is a highly mixed use environment. Uh, and yet we continue to build this homogenous, low density suburbia out on the fringe and really it's not great so there's nothing to walk to in a lot of this suburbia so the land uses are not there even if the street designs are wrong and this is now what we've got so this is today you can buy this house you can get this design built in the southern suburbs of brisbane and if aliens came from outer space and landed in my city they would think that there are these amazing creatures called cars who have captured a slave species called humans. Cars get the best rooms in the house uh, because over a third of the footprint of this dwelling is car parking. Um, and they get the room at the front of the house. There's no natural surveillance anymore from the kitchen or whatever. So parents are looking on the street, which means there's no natural eyes on the street. Uh, so no one wants their kids to play on the street anymore, do they? Um, and, you know, and humans feed these cars that they spend 
a horrendous amount of their uh, income uh, servicing. And so low income residents in Australian cities are being dispersed by housing markets to the outer suburbs where they pay a very high fixed transport cost to overcome um, the, the, you know, they're, they're trading that off with a lower, not low housing cost. And one of the reasons for that very high housing cost is we now build a minimum of two garages into almost every dwelling in Australia, uh, particularly uh, new build green fields. And out of that, you know, people stopped um, cycling. Uh, roads were, traffic speeds are too high in Australia. We, we don't have safe networks. We've started to build trunk networks in many cities, including in Canberra. We've got good recreational cycling, but for the share of all trips that people do, including the shopping to work and others, we've got a very low share. And at one point, we were the worst in the world, yay, in the, all the OECD, equal with the, uh, the, uh, the Americans. Yay, well done, Australia. And even worse than the Americans, we had less people uh, who were female cycling and the Americans. And when we think of vulnerable cyclists, um, you know, women, children, seniors, they are not seen in the numbers in Australia that we see in other countries. So we've got major problems with a toxic street environment for active transport. And when COVID happened, I've had numerous friends of mine say to me, oh my God, I finally get what you're talking about, Matt. Now I'm walking around my suburb Street speeds are too high. Traffic, people are crazy. They tried to run me, my wife and my kid over the other day. And these are people who've spent their lives in cars and haven't really occupied uh, that realm. So when we think about the determinants of health, of course, these environments are making us sick and they're not good in sustainability. Now, I, I want to show you some promising hope. And I show these slides all the time. And these are slides from Brisbane and they show the, num the percentage of people who are cycling to work in the inner city compared to how much bike infrastructure we have. And in 1986, there was only one place, one little part of the inner city where more than 2% of people rode a bike to get in it, um, into the centre of town to work. In 1991, we, we built our first uh, bikeway and so we we had to invent some new colours because some people were cycling in some new areas. And we also did some traffic calming in the inner city. And then in 1996, we built more of the network and we were starting to get network effects. And suddenly we've got all sorts of people. And we've got to invent new colours because people are starting to ride their bikes more. We had more um, bike infrastructure and you can see what happens in the city. People start cycling. By 2006, oh, we've got to invent even new colours because now we've got over 8% of people um, cycling to the city from certain neighbourhoods. And by the time we've started to build an embryonic network, we are, we, we've now started to have some success. So it's the build it and they will come philosophy writ large. You know, it's not rocket science. We induce new travel. When we make cycling and walking irresistible, people do it. When we make car driving irresistible, people do it. So I want to talk about the policy environment and why that is so skewed towards private motoring in Australia. We are now doing planning for bike networks. Now, all the Australian cities are doing this and you've been ahead of the game on this for a long time in Canberra, and that's great. And so there are lines on maps all over Australian cities and that's great, this is Brisbane's. Now, I regret to say, I will not live to see all those lines converted into bike facilities at the current rate of investment in that cycling infrastructure. I will die, even if I die age 100 plus, at the current rate of investment, I'm only in my mid 40s, I will not see that built. Because while we're planning for that infrastructure, and we've built the easy to build stuff, the stuff along the creek valleys, the stuff around the lakes, Canberra. Um, a lot of the more difficult to do bike infrastructure on arterial roads we built in the 80s, we are just not touching because it's too expensive to do. And we don't want to reclaim road space from private cars. And that is a big mistake.
Um, we are doing good things. So planning has started to really put bike infrastructure and walking infrastructure back into new suburbs. This is Aura, a suburb up in Caloundra, uh, award-winning because of its cycling infrastructure. So developers like Stockland, who built this suburb, are starting to be rewarded in sales for the fact that they are creating walking and cycling uh, suburbs again. And people are starting to want this infrastructure and demand it. Um, planning, and in particular, sustainability rating schemes like Green Star have also helped us get uh, end of trip facilities into major office buildings and now into smaller scale uh, commercial developments all over Australia. And that's because they get points and sustainability credits if they put this stuff in. And there's one building in Brisbane where 400 people arrive every day by bike. That would never have been possible 10 years ago. It is now possible because of network design and getting this infrastructure. But we still don't price motoring to reflect its true costs. And we don't, in business cases, price cycling to reflect its true benefits. And there are major issues with this. So Australians think we pay too much for fuel. People think, oh, you know, it's terrible, we're paying too much for fuel. I'd like to tell you, folks, we're about the, we're in the bottom four in the OECD for petrol prices. Uh, almost everywhere else in the world has higher petrol prices than us. To buy a car, we are one of the cheapest nations in the world to buy a car because we have such low tariffs. Uh, so even though we don't make cars, we've got one of the lowest tariff regimes and the lowest taxing regimes on imported vehicles. Uh, and we don't do road pricing, we don't do congestion pricing except for a few toll roads, including some rather spectacularly empty ones in Brisbane. Uh, but that's another story, uh, another transport scandal. Um, here is something I would like you today to join the winning side. Posted street speeds in Australia are now way out of whack. Even North America, even the USA, is well more advanced on slowing its local street speeds down than we are in Australia. We are completely, just completely brain dead in terms of what is going on at the moment here. Um, if you, but we think we're giving children safety at 40k per hour. If you hit a child at 40k per hour, chances are they die. And it is part of creating a disparity between the speeds for vulnerable road users, particularly cyclists and cars. And we need to get that disparity lowered so that those local streets are safe. And if we do this, we create a low risk environment for cycling right across Australian cities. Most streets become 30 kilometers per hour. So cheap to do. Uh, and just to show this, this is Washington DC. They are now introducing a new set of slow streets. The astonishing thing is they moved all their local streets to 30k per hour years ago. It was so successful, they are now moving a new set of substreets to even lower than 30k per hour to create further walkable and cyclable neighbourhoods. And also micro mobility, the little um, e bikes and e scooters. So, yeah. Yeah. one minute. <laughs> Great, I'm right at the end. Great. So, um, we've got very few active school travel programs and we need to do retrofits in the suburbs. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. That was very thought provoking. Um, all right, I'm going to keep going. Um, thanks for all the questions that are coming through in the chat. What we'll try and do is when we get to the end, I'll try to work through as many of those and send them off to the right person to see if they can answer them for you. Um, I'm now going to throw to uh, Dr. Jennifer Kent. Jennifer is a Senior Research Fellow in the Urban and Regional Planning Program at the University of Sydney. Jennifer's two key research themes include day-to-day -day mobility, in particular recording and theorising shifts away from private motor vehicles towards more sustainable transport modes in car-oriented cities. So seemingly very relevant to what we're, the challenges that are facing us here in Canberra. And the general links between the built environment and health, including various health impacts of transport, 
and the detrimental health implications associated with private car dependency. Um, Jennifer, I'd just like to check that you can get access to sharing your presentation. Uh, yeah, just a moment if yeah, I can yeah. find, where is it going? <laughs> Down yeah. the bottom in the middle should be a share oh. screen button. Oh no, I've got the share screen button. I'm just trying to find where my presentation is. Okay, there we go. Great, thanks Jennifer. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Helen, for that for that introduction, and thank you, Matt, for setting the scene. Uh, hopefully, here we go. I just wanted to start though by acknowledging that although tonight we're we're scattered across Australia and perhaps even around the world, most of us are meeting on Aboriginal lands. Uh, for me, I live in uh, on Wangal country, which is in the lands of the Eora Nation. Um, I want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of these lands, their elders past and present and emerging, and to acknowledge the uh, concept of country itself. Um, I also want to acknowledge that the lands that we convene on today are unceded lands. Now I'm going to be talking about some of the so social and cultural barriers to active transport and thanks Matt for defining that for me means that I don't have to do it. Matt's covered off on the policy environment and the built environment really nicely and I'm just going to balance it up by looking at uh, people's lived experience um, and their perceptions which is so important when we're trying to encourage shifts uh, away from one transport mode to another. So at the moment uh, when we think about transport as transport researchers often and definitely in transport policy we really prioritize utilitarian ways of thinking but there are other ways of thinking about transport so utilitarian ways are thinking about things like time cost and comfort in these theorizations uh, people travel the way that they do because it's the fastest or because it's the cheapest way but there are other reasons why people travel the way that they do. There's psychosocial reasons, things like trying to appeal to a certain social norm or wanting a sense of empowerment. And there's another set of theories that suggests that transport systems are actually autopoietic or self-sustaining and private car use particularly reflects this. So that sort of says that the way that we travel is this cycle. So our cities are planned around the private car and Matt explained how that's happened in Australian cities. That means that alternative modes such as public transport, walking and cycling are marginalised. It means that we develop this cultural acceptance of the car as the, the standard of travel and, and the standard that, that we feel like we have a right to as a society, which then reinforces the car as the, the popular option that's available. And so it goes, our cities then become planned around the car and so forth. So that's how the cycle of automobility has sort of worked to embed itself in Australian cities. And to be honest, we're really struggling to get out of that. One of the reasons that we're struggling is because of this concept of cultural acceptance and cultural appreciations. Now, I'm going to present some work here from some qualitative research, with, which I think is really undervalued in transport research. We don't spend enough time really talking to people and observing people and trying to understand how they're feeling and thinking and perceiving the way that they travel. And this is from a study from 2007, which has been subsequently backed up by more recent research. But I'm using these quotes here tonight because I think they're really telling. So this research gave four reasons why people don't cycle more. The first talks about the negative image of cyclists. So it's people who say, if you kept your bike when you're old enough to have a license, you were really considered a little bit weird. Another person, I don't like cyclists. They're an absolute pain on the road. I'll leave the other word out. And this issue of helmet hair, always a problem. And that comes up actually time and time again in the research, this idea of image, of cycling presenting some kind of an image that people definitely don't want to associate themselves with for whatever reason. And the idea of helmet hair is such a small thing, um, seemingly, but it does come up. It's, it's quite interesting how often that people will mention that. Now, uh, 
this is a, a not from that particular bit of research, but I still thought it was telling and I love it. It's from an old letter now and the letters to the editor of the Sydney Morning Herald when Ita Buttress was going for the position of Lord Merrill considering it of, of Sydney, going up against Clovermore, who is a impassioned and very successful cycling advocate and proudly rides her bike to the work to, to work every day. The quote said, I think Ida Buttress would make a wonderful Lord Mayor, at least she wouldn't ride a bike to work. Very telling. Now, the second reason is safety and security. And these are really key fundamental barriers that we have here in Australia. We've already mentioned it a little bit. This quote, when I moved to Balmain, I found there's nowhere to ride on where I'd feel safe on the road. That idea of just not being able to find a space or a route where you feel comfortable doing it. His second quote, I'm petrified to cycle from Enmore into the city because you'd have to go on along King Street, which is always a traffic nightmare. And I like how the language here is just so passionate. This, this person is not describing feeling a little bit uncomfortable. They're describing feeling petrified. This other person, I work late and I don't feel safe. In a car, you can lock the doors, but on your bike, you just have to ride fast. So that's bringing up the idea that the um, idea of being exposed as a cyclist is not just to other traffic, but to other people when you're on the bike. You definitely feel a lot more sa uh, safer and cocooned in a car, you know, surrounded by your own box of metal. And my kids would love to be able to just ride off, but I'm more protect protective. There's less trust now. There's definitely been this development where we are a lot more protective of our kids in a lot of different areas and the way that they travel is just one of them. Why else don't people ride? Inconvenience. This person says it's your way of life really, it's just easier driving by car, which for a lot of people it simply is. I'd really enjoy the ride but it's 45 minutes in the morning and again 45 minutes in the afternoon. This person mentions the idea of having to buy the equipment and maintain it and obviously learn how to do that. All the other things that, going with, that go with having to have a bike, again, the helmet comes up, but there's also things like bike locks and things that you need to carry, things that you need to carry to get changed into, towels, etc., etc. And the final quote here, the weather has a lot to do with it here. It's very cold in the winter and too hot, 40 degrees in the summer. So inconvenience is kind of referencing that idea of discomfort, this idea of putting your body in a physically uncomfortable position just for the sake of transport, which when we're used to driving a car, we're not used to having to do that. Now, I said before that the way that we really prioritise thinking about transport practices is by looking at transport as a utilitarian notion. So in transport research and, and policy, we're always trying to provide people with the fastest way to get to A to, from A to B, and we just assume that they'll choose that mode automatically. And that's what we call utilitarian ways of thinking about transport. So a few years ago, I wanted to test this, and I located a bunch of people who could who currently drive to work but could actually get to work faster using public transport or active transport modes so walking cycling or public transport I looked at about 850 driving journeys to work in outer suburban Sydney and I did a trip substitution analysis so for for example I looked at a car trip looked at how long the person had told me that that, that car trip currently takes them I went on to the transport websites and found out that, hey, you could actually catch the train or you could actually ride to work faster than what you're currently driving. Um, and then I sat down and did two very long interviews with these people. And these are some of the themes that came up. What I found was that for these particular group, this particular group of people, and this is qualitative research, so it's not necessarily generalizable, it's just giving us some insights into the way one particular group might think. But private car use was really giving their lives a sense of coherency. And I defined coherency as a sense of predictability, acceptance and autonomy. I'm just going to go through those quickly now. So the first one, predictability. We can see predictability as having this sense of routine. And in our modern lives where we're rushed and we're busy, psychosocial research tells us that we need to defer a certain amount of things in our day to a routine. They need to be automatic because if we got up and had to think and make decisions about every single thing that we were doing every day, we would go crazy. 
So Diane uses the car as her sort of space of ritual of getting to work, of getting ready for work every morning. She told me, yeah, I put my lipstick on while I'm waiting at the church or lights. It's a ritual. Frederick, similarly, for me, driving to work is just something I do. I don't think about it. I don't want to have to think about it every day. And that's the idea of having to defer certain things to routine because you've got so much going on in your life. You don't want to have to reconsider and make that new decision every day. Predictability is also about this sense of normality and prescribing to this sense of normality. And that doesn't only um, apply to normality as being seen to travel in the normal way. It also applies into it, to aspirations of living what we see as a normal sort of a life. And because of the way that our cities are structured and because of the way that our culture exists, the car is very much a part of that sense of a normal life. Megan, for example, describes that she had bought one particular house, renovated it, moved on, and then bought a new house which was bigger but unfortunately an hour's drive from where she worked and she needed her car therefore to get from, from her home to her work because of that. What she was actually trying to do was appeal to this sense of normalcy going through a housing career um, and deferring the transport choice as somehow inferior to that, that housing career choice as being the normal way to live. Now the second theme was autonomy. So some people consider autonomy as this having this sense of freedom. And that, again, is not only this sense of freedom about the way that we travel, but about the places where we live as well. So Larry, for example, lived about 90 minutes drive from where he works. And I asked him, have you ever considered moving closer to work? And he says, no, I live where I want to live and I work where the work is. I don't understand people that go, this is where I work and this is where I'll buy a house because it might not be the area that they want to live in. Now, a lot of our planning in Australia today is actually based on this concept of jobs, housing, balance, where we're trying to provide jobs closer to housing. But Larry's opinion here is shared by a lot of people who don't want to be their, their housing decision to be determined necessarily by their work location. Autonomy is also about having freedom from. So Diane here tells me that it would be viable for her to use alternative transport to get to work, but her life is so stressful that being able to be in the car, being able to have that sense of downtime is so important to her. It's one thing that she sort of indulges in. Acceptance is also about using the car to fit in. And I'm gonna to have to speed up, I think, a little bit. Helen, am I running out of time? <laughs> Okay, so Megan, for example, describes the pressure that she feels from her work to stay back and work late, which means that she doesn't therefore feel comfortable riding home from work after that in the, in the, in the dark. So she's using her car to fit into a certain kind of work culture. And Rebecca describes a similar thing. My managers expect that you're flexible with your hours. They expect that you work back and can leave a bit earlier the next day. And we all work hard, we all put in the hours, and if one of us isn't putting the, in the work, it wouldn't be a nice feeling. So she's using it to fit in at work. Automobility is also about this sense of self-nurture for a lot of people. And I'll finish on this quote from Frederick, who says, I remember a long time ago, I used to catch the train to work. It was really busy, people always trying to find their way and trying to squeeze in. Sometimes the door shuts too early. And then I think about taking my car. Even if it's an hour, an hour, 15 minutes, even if it's longer, I don't care. I think, oh, it's fine. I have the air conditioning. I listen to a bit of music, best of the 80s, the news from the ABC. And this idea of the car being this cocooning um, space of self-comfort comes up time and time and time again in the research. And I think we need to take that sense that people are feeling very seriously in our lives today. So for some people, cars provide that sense of predictability, autonomy and acceptance. And what I'm wondering is whether these are elements that are increasingly under threat in our modern lives. I'll end with one example about how we're increasingly asking people to live in higher density spaces and to work in spaces that are shared. For these people who are now perhaps living in an apartment, whereas before they may have lived in the house, and they're hot desking, whereas before they may have had their own little workspace. Time in their car is the only time that they have in their modern life where they can personalize the space 
and have that sense of acoustic um, and even a little bit of visual privacy and time out. And we need to keep that, I think, at the forefront of our minds and take it seriously when we're considering why people are perhaps not quite so excited and enthusiastic about active transport modes as we would hope that they would be. So I'll leave that for you to you there and hopefully we can have a bit of a chat at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. That's very thought provoking and slightly challenging, I think, for how we move forward. Um, and uh, very relevant to some conversations we've been having just recently around thinking about people in workplaces and commuters and how we can encourage them to shift to active transport. Um, I'm going to throw now to Ian Ross, who is the uh, CEO of Pedal Power here in the ACT. Pedal Power is our peak cycling advocacy body. They've championed the, course, the cause of cycling in Canberra for over 40 years, starting at a protest ride in 1974 and growing into Canberra's largest cycling organisation. Their mission is to get more Canberrans riding more often for a better community. Uh, Ian joined Pedal Power in 2018 after a long career in the Canberra disability sector. He's a keen rider, whether he's commuting to work or riding recreationally on or off the road. And he's passionate about growing Canberra's cycling community and supporting Canberra to become the cycling capital of Australia. So I'm going to throw over to Ian now, and I think he has a presentation to share as well, and hopefully that will all go smoothly. Let me know if it doesn't. Hello, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to um, uh, participate um, tonight. Um, I've certainly uh, really enjoyed hearing from both Matthew and Jennifer, and hopefully what you'll see um, uh, is somewhat consistent with, <laughs> with the, uh, the broad information and messages that you've got so far. So, um, yes, I want to talk about active travel in the ACT and, uh, and from specifically uh, a, a specific of a cycling organisation. I can think I can jump through the first slide because uh, Helen has very kindly introduced me and also introduced Pedal Power. I think the, the probably the key thing to say is that we are promoting cycling because we think ultimately it's the benefit of the ACT community um, and that's something that we very strongly uh, support. Um, so um, let's just look at cycling in the ACT first up. Um, this comes from the 2016 Census Day data, um, uh, uh, and uh, this is the uh, information about um, uh, the number of people who, who uh, travel to work and, and by mode share. Um, uh, active travel by all modes, cycling, walking and, and public transport, uh, sorry, active travel by all modes, um, uh, that includes cycling, walking and public transport, as you can see, represents about 16% of the total travel on census day. And that's compared with 81% of travel by private vehicles. So uh, this very much reiterates what Matthew was saying, that, that private vehicles are very much the king uh, and have been developed very much in, in the ACP. Uh, of the three modes of active travel, cycling, as you can see, is the lowest at 3%, uh, and it's almost as low as the number of people who did not bother to cycle, go to work on that day, or perhaps were sick or stayed at home, or, or in 2016, possibly a few were working from home. So what I want to focus on tonight is just um, uh, active travel from a cycling perspective and look at Pedal Power's thoughts about what the challenges are um, uh, in that active travel space and what we could potentially do about it. So just a little bit about cycling in the ACT. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, we have a city that's excellent location for cycling. Um, uh, I realize that uh, some people may, have, I, I certainly have a bunch of, uh, of uh, images on the right hand corner of my screen and, uh, and I maximize the screen space. So um, uh, apologies if you can't quite see all the, the slides, but I will uh, make the slides available uh, if, if uh, the view uh, doesn't, doesn't quite work. Anyway. Cycling in the ACT. Um, we mostly have dry weather. Uh, we mostly have um, uh, favorable terrain. Um, it's obviously a mountain city, but we do have a mixture of flat terrain and, and, uh, and uh, lakeside routes um, uh, dispersed by hills. Uh, we have fantastically clean air and, uh, and 
spectacular landscape. Uh, Canberra is just a delight to cycle. Uh, it's a thrill every morning when I jump on my bike and, and commute to work. Um, we have uh, really solid off-road and on-road cycle paths. We have a history of having those developed and they link our major town centres and our residential suburbs. And we have higher than average uh, cycling participation. Um, so you can see this is the graph, the cycling participation graph, and this comes from the National uh, Cycling Participation Survey published by Ostroads. Um, it was a survey in the ACT of about a thousand uh, people's participation. And as you can see, um, across the board uh, um, uh, for people who participated, um, this is 2019 data, by the way. Uh, so it's quite recent. It's the last survey that was conducted by Ostroads and sadly, um, no longer is being conducted. So we will lose that, that data set um, uh, from here on in. Um, but anyway, you can see that, that across the board, ACT is the green um, uh, bar there, and, uh, and we have higher than, than average participation uh, in Australia um, in the ACT. So um, this is um, uh, uh, the same data. So it's the census data, um, but um, uh, uh, it shows uh, cycling participation by suburbs. I think the key thing to say is <laughs> um, that according to census data in 2016, only 3% of people cycled to work. So that's still very low uh, percentage of people. Um, that of course is different depending on which suburb you live in. Uh, and as you can see on this graph, um, the in our central Canberra has higher participations, those, those kind of red colours, um, uh, and the further out of Canberra you get, uh, the uh, lower the participation rates are. Um, and the newer suburbs have very low participation rates. The highest participation rate was 17.6%, and that was in Acton. Um, uh, and the lowest that had a positive figure was in Banks down here in the far south, um, and that had 0.2% uh, of people who cycled. Um, if we uh, use the same uh, maps, but we look at participation um, uh, um, by men and women, you'll see that uh, there's also some significant differences. There is much higher percentage of men who uh, ride than there are women uh, in Canberra. Um, and the further out again you go, uh, the less women uh, ride, uh, less, less both men and women, but certainly less women who ride uh, across the uh, suburbs. Um, cycling participation by age, again, this is 2019 data from that, that cycle survey. Um, uh, and you will see, um, uh, and I was reflecting on Jennifer's comment that you're weird if you're cycling after 18, uh, you know, once you get a car, and that's clearly the data in the ACT and, and across Australia. You can see again, uh, the ACT data is, is green there. And you can see that we've got, you know, 44, 45% of, of people uh, cycling until uh, we hit um, uh, 18 year olds where, where people start um, uh, being able to drive cars and then people fairly quickly um, uh, move on to driving cars and cycling participation pretty much disappears. Um, um, this is an interesting question and you can't see the answers I've just noticed. Um, uh, I, I will tell you the top two. So um, uh, um, uh, this, uh, this question is why have you not used your cycle for travel to work in the past year? Um, and the top two answers were that it was too far at 49%. Um, and at 24%, too many things to carry. Um, at 21%, it's um, uh, prefer alternative methodologies. And then at 5%, uh, perception of danger. So those are the top four reasons why people chose not to cycle. So that was capturing the people who have not been cycling. Um, the survey also captured what would uh, encourage more people to ride. The, 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 the top um, uh, um, uh, by reasons are there, you can see it's pretty much all about infrastructure. So people, uh, this is in 2019, ACT uh, residents, um, uh, people want more off-road paths and cycleways, better connections to schools, to shops, um, uh, better connections to what I presume is community facilities, so parks and swimming pools, uh, and more signs highlighting um, uh, the cycling routes. So they're, they're all things that that survey found. 
So what does all this mean? Um, uh, I think the first thing we can probably say, and I think Jennifer really made this clear, uh, and as did Matthew, um, that we have a culture in the ACT and a community that's being built uh, to value private vehicles. 81% uh, of us drive uh, and our, uh, our youth abandon uh, bikes for cars as soon as they have the capacity. The next thing I want to talk about is, is distance. Uh, distance came up as one of the clear things that, that is an issue for Canberrans uh, in their decisions to ride. Um, uh, and uh, I guess um, one of the issues is uh, that uh, many of the, the paths which uh, provide uh, safe off-road travel are uh, nonetheless uh, quite indirect. So I'm going to use um, this uh, slide here. Um, uh, just in introducing it, um, uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics shows that about, um, uh, on, on average, uh, in Australia, about 7.6 kilometres um, is, um, is the average distance that anyone would, uh, anyone cycles in Australia. Um, pedal power would kind of posit that up to 10 kilometres might be reasonable if you particularly had an e-bike um, uh, and, um, and, uh, and, you know, with some practice perhaps, you know, up to 10 kilometres might be kind of a reasonable distance that, that, that people could cycle. So this is, this is woden to, to, to the city. Uh, uh, there would be quite a number of people from the south side who might kind of live in that catchment uh, and decide to, to ride. So if you uh, were brave enough and decided to ride down uh, Yarra Glen up Adelaide Avenue and across the bridge on the road, uh, then that's going to take you 10 kilometres. I would suggest that probably most people would not want to do this. So this is the same journey, um, but it is by bike using the most direct um, uh, cycle path um, uh, off-road. Uh, and as you can see, the distance is almost half the distance again. Uh, and so there's probably not that many people who are going to be uh, making that distance if they are not already uh, um, in cycle. So um, next thing I want to just raise is that we continue to have uh, missing links. Uh, in the ACT. Um, this is um, me, so uh, I'm, I'm uh, broadcasting where that dot is, um, uh, and, um, and this is my uh, local shopping centre, the Casey Market Town, um, and I go there two or three times a week to do my weekly shopping. Um, and as you can see, the path to my local shopping centre is about five kilometres, which is pretty reasonable. I would be quite happy uh, cycling that distance to get to my shopping centre to pick up stuff and go back. But uh, you will notice that, that about where that car picture is, is Coringa Drive. Coringa Drive is a 70 kilometre hour road, a single lane, at no shoulder, no bend. I, I've cycled it twice since I've lived here. Each time I felt like I've taken my life in my hands. Uh, <laughs> This is the uh, cycle route that one might take if one were, were to travel the same distance and, and go off-road. As you can see, it is almost 12 kilometres to get to the Casey Market Town. And any guesses how many times I might have travelled there to go shopping? The answer, of course, is zero. So um, I just, we, we've already covered these, these points, so I won't go over them again. But these are the other challenges that we've, 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 we've talked about. Uh, capacity to transport others was, was raised as, as, you know, we need to be able to carry things uh, and, and carry luggage. Um, we've talked about low participation levels in outer suburbs. Perceptions that cycling un is unsafe was clearly raised in, in that survey. Uh, and we, we clearly have uh, a need to support more women to ride. So I would say that they largely are the challenges uh, in addition to <laughs> uh, insufficient end of trip facilities, that we 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 still have uh, problems with uh, with insufficient end of trip facilities in the ACT. All right, but the good news is that um, that when asked uh, across the board whether people would be willing to uh, uh, consider tri cycling for transport, you can see that almost 50% of people said that they would be willing to consider cycling for transport. Uh, only 53% of people said that they would not be willing. There's a large real estate there of people who might be willing to, to take it if the circumstances were right and if we could uh, meet those challenges. So what do we need? Uh, I would say we need these three things. We need um, strong leadership, we need uh, infrastructure that supports cycling, and we need culture change. And um, I just want to talk very briefly around those. 
Um, so first of all, uh, um, I just kind of credit where credit is due. Um, Ian, uh, Ian. Yep. sorry, I've, I've, you got one more minute to go. <laughs> ah, okay. Sorry to cut you short. I think, I think I'm going to be, be, be really, uh, really quick. Okay. Um, so. Um, uh, we've had uh, some good uh, some good policy direction in the ACT uh, over the, the last couple of years. Really excited about the um, climate change strategy, which has some clear active travel targets. Um, we're looking forward to moving Canberra being uh, launched, um, and we are hoping that they will have clear target benchmarking and monitoring. Um, we need uh, resourcing and implementation uh, of, of that strategy. Um, we need to finalise the end of trick facilities code, uh, and we need a uh, really strong whole of government uh, leadership. Uh, in infrastructure, um, uh, again, um, we've been really pleased to see that there has been some strong development with uh, separated bicycle ways in, in Belconnen and Woden and some, some infrastructure in Tigranong about to come online. The uh, stimulus packages that um, have been um, uh, uh, announced in, in recent uh, uh, months uh, in response to COVID has certainly presented um, uh, uh, a clear indication that the ACD government is willing to, to support some further development of cycling. Um, but we need a long-term plan going forward uh, that connects those missing links, that expands with population growth, that provides safe, fast commuter corridors uh, and improves a perception of safety. And that could be around lighting and traffic calming speed measures. Um, we need our paths maintained if they're not maintained and they are crumbling and falling apart at the moment. People are not going to ride on them. So, you know, when there's holes, when there's, when there's grass growing through the, your, 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 your path, when there are trees uh, cracking, it, 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 it's a problem and we need a, a strategy and a rolling program to maintain them and not just fixing them when they're broken. Um, we need public transport that fully supports cycling and we need more secure cycle parking. Lastly, cultural change. Um, we clearly need a marketing and education program. We can't sell cycling. We can't convince people to, to cycle if we don't talk to them about it and if we don't sell the benefits. So we, we clearly need a program of, of selling and marketing pro, uh, cycling, specifically e-bikes. E-bikes are clearly going to make a difference. They're going to expand the range of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of travel that, uh, that people can do. And cargo bikes are also a way of enabling people to... Um, to uh, carry their luggage and expand the options. Really excited to see the ACD government is supporting uh, a trial of, of cargo bikes uh, and e-bikes. Uh, it's going to make a difference uh, once people kind of realise the benefits there. Uh, and lastly, oops, uh, lastly, we need to support businesses to um, uh, um, uh, support their staff to, to um, the cycle. And I was really pleased to see again that in the uh, climate change strategy there, that the Act Smart um, um, uh, unit is going to be tasked with, with, the, with, the, with the task of, of supporting um, uh, individual businesses and community organisations to support their staff to, to active travel. So in conclusion, those are the, the, the pillars that we think. We, we, you know, we need continued leadership uh, from the top, we need uh, infrastructure and we need culture change. All right, thank you. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Ian. That was that was really great. Um, I'm going to press on and introduce our next speaker, just so that we can give ourselves a good amount of time at the end to um, ask some questions. So we're really pleased tonight to have um, Ben McHugh speaking. Ben is joining us on his iPhone. I'm just trying to see Ben if you can. Yeah, I've just unmuted myself. Yeah. <laughs> if you put your speaker view on, you'll be able to see Ben. But there he is. Um, and Ben is the Acting Deputy Director General of Transport Canberra and Business Services. Has someone else got, ah, oh, okay, I'm getting, that's right, I'm giving you feedback, that's okay. Um, Transport Canberra and Business Services, which is a division within Transport Canberra and City Services. Ben, I'm just going to mute you for a second until I stop speaking, okay, hold on. Um, so Transport Canberra and City, uh, City Services uh, is responsible for the management and operation of Canberra's public transport network, including a bus fleet of over 400 buses, two major depots and workshops, and more than 800 staff. Um, this role also oversees the operation of light rail services between Gungahlin and the city under a public-private partnership with Canberra Metro, between Canberra Metro and the ACT government. And Transport Canberra and Business Services also manages a range of other 
government services and businesses, including capital linen libraries, ACT and Yarralum Nursery, which I think just goes to show that Ben is an incredibly busy man. Um, and we're incredibly grateful to have you here tonight. So thank you very much, Ben. Um, did you want to share a PowerPoint as well or did you just want to have a chat? Um, look, I um, cheated a little bit and one of my responsibilities is um, our transport planning department, which also has the active travel office in it and then, and Napier has um, uh, generously given up their time today to put a presentation together. So it's only fair that we, we take that up. Um, I am a little bit uh, nervous that it's going to be death by statistics because I had a quick flick through it beforehand and it, it does reflect quite a bit of the, the work that Ian's just referred to. So um, if you can find Ian and get her to flick that up, that'd be great. And she might um, run through um, some of that before we open up quickly to questions at the end. So we'll get through the presentation quickly, noting that we want to give everyone yeah, some time. Great. Right. So Ian, I know you're here. So um, you should be able to just share the presentation now. Okay, now ah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Do you need to Okay, so I'll just see how we go sharing that. Um, hope everybody can see that. Yep, lovely, thank you. Great. All right, um, all right. so um, thank you everybody else for, for setting the scene. That does make it a bit easier. I'm going to try to um, go a little bit quicker. Um, um, it's great. Ian's prevent, uh, presented a, a, a fantastic picture um, of, 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 of active travel patterns in the ACT. Um, before I jump into some of our um, active travel policy responses, um, it is worth just stepping back and I think that some of the, um, the comments that were made earlier about the legacy that the ACT has um, really uh, helps to, to, to set the scene for what we can do with active travel in the ACT. So um, if we think broadly about um, our transport policy challenge, um, can Barron's really uh, value the, the livability, the ease of getting around, um, that they have access to, to everything they need to do within 30 minutes of their homes, and that is car dependent. Um, so our big policy challenges for transport policy are about um, uh, how we support urban intensification so people can use, um, have, have the, the services and the jobs they need um, close to where they live. Um, how we manage congestion um, with Canberra growing, you know, we have, uh, it's forecast that um, we'll see increased congestion if we continue to grow the way that we are um, with our population being projected to, to grow further. Um, and of course, the uh, very significant issue of reducing um, uh, emissions in that context. So yes, we've, um, we've inherited this, um, this legacy of a, of a car-centric city, um, but also uh, incredible foresight um, of a network of, of shared paths um, that other cities simply don't have. Um, so, so that's quite exciting for us. So, so that context, um, uh, that transport policy, policy context is about a network that supports us to move efficiently. Um, and we need to think about that in, in, in different ways and the, the different uh, transport types or modes that are available to us. Um, and local living supports, um, supports those, those small scale um, transport types of walking and cycling um, and on demand um, transport. And that's uh, a mixture of what we have today and things like bike share, um, ride share, um, and future uh, opportunities with e-scooters, etc. Um, and then once we start to go beyond the local, um, then we see where public transport fits in. Um, but as we uh, as we look at the transport links across the city and around the city, that's where we see those other modes um, aren't necessarily going to meet our needs. And so we'll continue to be dependent on car transport and obviously freight uses those networks as well. And then obviously we're, we're situated in a region as well that connects to um, uh, towns and cities um, outside of Canberra and of course the world. Okay, so this is a this is a lovely little um, infographic. Um, it's on our website. I encourage people to look at it. It's just a scene setting one um, from our 
from a, a household travel survey in 2017, which looked at the, um, the, the travel habits of, of Canberrans. Um, so, so if you just have a look at some of those, those statistics and just reflect on those as we go through the presentation, um, um, one of the startling things um, here is, is that people walk for approximately 11 minutes per day. Now, that's, um, that's an average um, and some people are walking more, some people are, are walking less, but in terms of health, that's quite a frightening one. Um, um, we have high car and bicycle ownership. Um, we make three and a half trips per person. Um, our average trip distance, about eight kilometres. Um, this one here, uh, now I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can people see my cursor? I'm, I'm circling the 94% of people, the yellow one, 94% um, of people over 18 years hold a driver's licence, which means that a lot of people, uh, there's this extraordinary opportunity there for road user education when young people are coming through and getting their driver's licence. Um, to to rethink that as, as road user education. And of course, we have also had those those much earlier opportunities through schools. Um, this trip, this average trip time of 21 minutes, um, again, you know, this will be skewed by vehicle, um, by motor vehicle transport. But anyway, so that's on our website, um, do, do pick it up. Um, um, so again, so I'm, I'm using more data from, uh, from our household travel survey. That was really fantastic that Ian was able to refer to the census. Um, this is a little bit more granular. Um, the household travel survey looks at um, different trip types um, for employment, for shopping, um, for social and, and recreational purposes. Um, this regional breakdown um, looks at how we travel depending on where we live. Um, and I don't know if you can, I hope you can see the detail there. Um, and obviously that red in those circles for each of those regions, that really um, it shows that stark vehicle driver um, or all passenger um, uh, 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 trips. Um, and then the yellow, which is the combined active travel of walking, cycling, bus and other, you know, scooters, etc. Um, transport. So, so we see that that varies um, significantly, but of course, the central areas that are much uh, better serviced for, for those active modes in North Canberra and South Canberra, we see those, those much higher rates. Um, then another interesting thing to note is that blue-green divide about trip containment. Um, and that's looking at uh, the trips that people make um, and how much of their, their, their trips are satisfied locally. So the blue means that they're going out of their district, out of these districts of, um, of the of Belconnen, South Canberra, etc. Um, and then how many of those trips are satisfied locally. And I'm going to pull out a little bit more about Belconnen because Belconnen we can see here is actually about equal. In some of these other areas, you look at Gungahlin on the other side of the screen, um, most of the um, trip needs um, are external to that, that district. So it is convenient to look at Belconnen, but, it, but you know, we, we see that there's significant challenges, different challenges for different regions. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, trip purposes and modes of travel. So again, you know, there we have home to work. That's very much, uh, very motor vehicle dominant. Um, home to education is much more as a passenger, whether that's passenger uh, in a car um, or public transport. And of course, this is all, this is all um, pre-COVID. Pre um, and then social and recreational, and this is where we see many more walking trips coming in. So, um, so small amounts for, for work-based travel, um, uh, bigger for, for home uh, to education trips, which reflects uh, school students and, and those who, who are able to, um, who go to school locally, who are able to use those active modes. Um, but then yes, in the social, uh, the social and recreational category, we see um, that, uh, that that big slice of, of people who, who walk um, for, for social purposes, recreational purposes. Um, so then over on the left, um, when we look at those two modes of, of, um, of human-powered transport, um, the bike 
Um, and this goes into the comments that um, Jennifer made about, about that reliability. Um, uh, perhaps the bike is very, um, a very reliable form for those people who do use it um, and they see that as um, a reliable, predictable, routinised um, way of, of, um, of uh, getting to work, even if it is only 3% of people. Um, whereas walking, not so much. And again, we see that, that social and recreational purpose um, there. Um, and Ian, uh, through the cycling participation survey, um, showed some of those reasons why people may choose one mode or another. Um, then if we look down here uh, at some of those um, uh, distances and um, time that people spend using our, our active modes, our human powered modes, um, uh, walking trips generally 12 minutes and about 1.2 kilometres um, and bike trips 20, uh, 20 minutes um, and about 4.4 kilometres. Um, now going back to that idea about, about local trips, um, uh, we know that a lot of our emissions, um, that if a lot of, if most of our work, if most of our travel um, is about journey to work. Um, we there is a really strong opportunity to reduce emissions through those trips. Um, however, uh, there are many complexities about addressing um, about addressing the journey to work, and, and that we can see down here um, uh, uh, at the bottom in the work related travel within Belconnen um, shows that. Um, most people have to travel outside of the region, which means those trips are longer, um, there's more complexity, um, there are some of those gender issues start to come in. Um, so it's really interesting to do a bit of analysis to look at um, the trips that are satisfied locally, um, um, to buy things for education, first for business. Um, and as we saw um, in an earlier slide, in Belcon, a lot of that travel is, um, is satisfied locally. Um, so if we start to look at some of those distances, um, those internal distances when people are making trips in Belconnen, and it's very similar for the other, um, for the other town centres, it's just we're focusing on this one because so many of those trips are made internally, we see that there are lots of opportunities for those trips to be made um, um, using active modes, in particular, in particular cycling. Um, and then we've got the, the ACT averages. So you can see that there's that opportunity, not only are, are most of those trips being made um, internally, um, but they're also uh, uh, cyclable distances. And of course, with e-bikes, um, even more so, um, increasing that range by two to three times. Um, now, Ian, I, I can't remember if Ian provided this particular graph. Um, but uh, the cycling, so this is the only one I've got from the cycling participation survey. Um, now, the cycling participation survey asks the same questions uh, in all jurisdictions, and there's a very strong focus on um, on infrastructure in, in trying to, to drill down to the infrastructure barriers. Um, and so the ACT response is yes, reflected. Um, uh, the need to um, to improve the, the cycling network, um, connect to schools, um, connect uh, to develop wayfinding so people can actually uncover um, where the paths are. You know, part of our wonderful legacy is we have these beautiful paths that go through green belts and people don't know where they are. Um, so there's work to do there. Um, in addition to those barriers identified in the, the um, cycling participation survey, um, there are also um, you know, anecdotally, we know that there are environmental factors um, uh, that are perceived um, to be um, to make cycling and walking less attractive um, in uh, the ACT, um, including our climate. Yes, it is mild, um, uh, uh, and and yes, our geography is actually is quite favourable. People who come from Sydney will will talk about Canberra being quite flat. Um, um, but we do have that challenge, yes, of, of, of distance, um, and that's not quite picked up by the um, by the, the uh, um, by, by this by this data. Now, this data, sorry, if I can go back, this data is actually about um, what um, respondents thought um, could be done um, to 
uh, improve. So these are not the barriers. These are actually um, these are actually what respondents thought um, uh, governments need to do to um, encourage more walking and cycling. And um, and you're going to cut me off? Yep, <laughs> soon. <laughs> oh, okay, I've got one minute. All right, I'm just going to very very briefly um, talk about the enablers um, that the ACT can. Um, ACT government can can uh, uh, can do to support um, more active travel, more walking, and more cycling. Um, things that we have done, the active living principles in the territory plan to guide planning decisions, um, the vulnerable road user reforms um, to to uh, to protect. Um, oops, I've gone forward. I meant to go back. Um, to protect um, road users um, and prioritise uh, vulnerable road users. Um, we are working through workplace travel planning um, uh, guidance. Um, we have the award-winning schools programs. Um, there's future work um, in outreach and behavioural change through ActSmart that, um, that Ian alluded to. Um, and then other activities that we're already running. Um, then there's the integration with the transport system. So this is this is those opportunities where the distances are too great um, to integrate with the existing um, transport system through a secure bike uh, cages, um, driving parkway, and and um, micro mobility. Um, I think that uh, look. I'll, I, I think we'll probably end up taking some questions on, on design and maintenance, so I'll leave that for the moment. Um, and we'll probably talk a little bit more, I imagine there'll be questions about um, the, the, the cycling network, but we have a network plan um, connected up with wayfinding signage, um, a journey planner, maps, um, um, and visitor information. Uh, you know, yes, there's an education campaign to to make sure people know that that network exists. Um, now, this is probably the thing that I would have liked to have spent the most time on, um, uh, and that's the role of government in enabling community-led initiatives. Um, we have grants programs um, that that the community can access to um, to come up with their own. Um, uh, oops, I've sped forward again. Um, to take action where, where, where they see the need is. Um, and we have pedal power, um, uh, big skills for little bikes. Um, we've got, uh, I think Ian alluded to um, some trials with e-bikes and e-cargo bikes. Um, we've got the schools programs that work cooperatively with communities, um, Act Smart, um, workshops uh, which will which will be working through households, um, schools and business. Um, uh, I've totally glossed over um, the, the new um, community partnership of slower streets um, which is picking up on, on the earlier um, comments about the need to slow down streets and this was one of our, our COVID-19 um, uh, bits of opportunism where um, where we're we're working with local communities to um, to create safer environments where communities identify what their priorities are. We provide the resources, um, but then it's it's led from the community rather than from the the government. So that um so that starts that conversation. It doesn't achieve all of the the things that we need to do to create this to create the safe system. It doesn't. It's just to get the conversation started and for communities to decide if that's what they want. Um, uh, in in their in their locations, so we've got ten suburbs now that have come on board, um, and uh, and we'll see we'll see where that where that takes us. Um, now, obviously, through the climate change strategy, there's a there's a leadership and role modelling um, aspect aspect to all of this, and we're working through um, uh, our own workplace travel planning because we're moving into some new office buildings um, in both Civic and in Dixon. Um, we've established a, a, a workplace e-bike bike fleet, including a cargo bike, um, and as I mentioned before, the AtSmart um, programs. Um, Future opportunities. Uh, look, everybody's alluded to um, uh, the transformative opportunity from um, from COVID nineteen. Um, people have people have really enjoyed living locally um, and have looked at their suburbs differently. 
Um, if we continue, if, if many people continue to work um, from home, we're going to see more of that local living and, and, and hopefully more demand um, for, for uh, environments that are more conducive. Sorry, I keep on clicking on my screen. Um, uh, that are more conducive to, to, to walking and cycling locally. Um, other future opportunities, uh, you know, there's, 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 there's technology that, that, that. Sorry, and I'm going to have to. Um, so, and we haven't quite, uh, well, we just need to be, we just need to be ready, um, in terms of the links, in terms of the corridors that we create, uh, to, to provide for, um, those new technologies, um, where we see shared mobility, um, and autonomous vehicles coming in. Um, and the, the sort of pain. Sorry, we seem to be, we seem to have lost Anne. I think she's been muted. I'm sure. Anne, are you there? Can you hear me? Oh. I'm here, Helen. Yeah, okay, I lost. Sorry. I, lost <laughs> sorry, I think we were right near the end there anyway. Sorry, Anne, you've just gone silent on us. I promise I didn't switch you off. <laughs> um, you might need to just try and unmute yourself at your end. Oh, there we go. You've, you've, I think I have that now. Yeah, okay. yeah. Sorry about um, that. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, thank you so much. I don't know where I lost you, but I think we'll probably leave it there and, and I'm sure that there'll be some questions, but um, if there's any, yeah. Okay, so we've actually, we've got a ferocious amount of questions and uh, thank you so much for all of the questions on the chat. Well, I'm going to go straight to a couple of them that I've pulled out. Um, I'm going to throw to Jennifer and Matthew first. Um, we've got a question about the, the um, future of e-scooters and the right. trends around the world. I just wonder if you'd like to make right. a comment about the role of e-scooters that you see. So I'll just speak very, very briefly. The Brisbane experience is that we've had 2,000 uh, scooters put out on the streets by two different firms, Lime and Euron, who have very different vehicles. One of them has just been forced by the ACCC to basically broadcast that they lied and had vehicles that were unsafe uh, with wheels clamping up and were sending people over the, the front handlebars. Uh, that's Lyme. Uh, not a great experience. Neuron, different company, has had a very different approach to working with governments. Um, all their people are their own employees. They go and get the vehicle, onto things themselves. Much less clutter, much better experience, safer vehicle, less road trauma. So you can see that this is an embryonic industry that's going to take its time to to resolve all its issues and some of the firms seem to be working better to resolve those issues it's amazing that a bigger wheel is safer who would have thought and um uh so some of those things are starting to be ironed out i'm cautiously optimistic about it as a mode of transport moving forward it's certainly better than having people in cars i'll just i'll just add to that Really briefly, um, I was in a seminar this morning with Andrew Constance, the New South Wales Minister for Transport, and he mentioned East, well, somebody mentioned East scooters and he was almost fell off his chair and couldn't cope with the idea. Well, I think he was only just getting to get his head around e-bikes and so forth. So I think it's going to be a while before we see any uh, institutional support for East scooter in, in New South Wales, given his reaction. Um, in my mind, as Matt said, so embryonic and embryonic not only in terms of technology and the way that the systems are operating, but in the way that we as a culture are ready to deal with modes like that. I think we've got a long way to go before we see the uptake of e-scooters in Australian cities like we've seen in, in the world. Sorry, I'm trying to stop the feedback. I'm going to throw to Jennifer again for a quick, another quick question and to Matthew, uh, so a general question about infrastructure and Matthew, you might have an answer for this one as well, around um, the use of shared zones in town centres. Um, I'll read it out for you. I'm not, sorry, I'm not going to have time to throw to people. No, but shared, shared space, shared zones in town centres. Yep, 
Yep, we got that one. So we're going to see huge demand for this very shortly. Um, so there's an awful lot of street closures that are happening during COVID. And it's the restaurateurs who are now really pushing for this in Europe and North America. And we're going to see this in Australia. The data is coming out that eating outdoors is a hell of a lot safer than eating indoors in COVID. Uh, so pop-up street closures, tactical urbanism, as we call it, we're going to see a lot of this. Uh, and we, in, on, you know, in the active transport community, we need to be promoting this. Um, now, shared space is the idea that uh, you get to a very low speed, 10 kilometres per hour, and everybody just negotiates. And it seems to work well in most circumstances. Um, and indeed, many of the shared space treatments, when the designs are well thought through, have better safety profiles and actually better throughputs. Um, so, for instance, buses don't have to wait 90 seconds or two minutes to enter an intersection. They can actually get through. There's all sorts of stuff that, that works. Um, I'm, so long as good urban designers are involved, most shared space treatments tend to be effective and tend to work in town centres. Great, thank you, Matthew. Um, here's one for Ben and Anne. I think, I'm hoping you might be able to give an update about the um, much awaited moving, tra moving, moving yeah. transport strategy. Um, where the, cons the consultation for that was, we know, was at the beginning of last year. Um, can you able to give a, a bit of an update on that, Ben? Or Yeah, look, I absolutely can. Um, like everything um, that's happened, COVID has, has delayed what we'd planned to release earlier in, earlier in the year. But it's also given us an opportunity to actually reflect on what was in moving Canberra and whether there are learnings, early learnings from COVID that we can actually embed in the transport strategy moving forward. So um, we are at the back end of that review process, uh, about to feed the document back through the approvals within government um, uh, with the intention of releasing it very soon. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask a general question, perhaps to, the, um, to Matthew and Jennifer again, and, and feel free to jump in and if you'd like to. And then. Um, I wanted to talk about, uh, Jennifer, you talked about a lot about the obstacles for people making change. And I wondered what you thought was the best way forward in terms of pushing through those obstacles and actually taking people on that, that cultural journey with us. Have you done any work that sort of looks about where we are now, but where we, where we need to go in the conversations we need to have with people? Um, yeah, I think, I think what we're going to be seeing in terms of encouraging people through transition, what seems to be the most important thing is offering an array of mobility options. So the answer is not going to come from one particular mobility mode, but being able to give people autonomy around having a choice of how they travel. So that might look like a transport system where some trips are taken by bikes, some are by walking, others car trips are substituted with car sharing. I don't only mean Uber, but also um, commercial car sharing services um, like GoGet and so forth. Um, and then there's public transport systems there to obviously fill in some of the, the major gaps as well. So I think that's going to be key is offering people as many opportunities as possible, as many different options and giving them the ability to choose and having sort of that sense of empowerment about choosing. Um, there's a lot more that I could say, obviously, ab about trying to, you know, normalise things like cycling and so forth. Um, and that's just, as you say, a cultural journey that we need to take people on with us, um, be uh, understanding and, um, and with them in that space rather than sort of trying to set up any kind of antagonism because we know that if we do that, the cycling and the walking community is not going to come off best, both both physically and in a, a policy sense when, when we come up against the um, machinery of the car in so many different senses. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I'm trying to just get a balance across the question. So pardon me for jumping around a little bit, but there has been a, quite a conversation about helmet law in the chat feed. Somebody just reminded me. Um, so, sorry, excuse the dog. Um, happy to talk helmet law. I'm going to throw happy it to do that. Yeah, to you, Matthew, and then yeah. make Ben as well and just mute myself. Or, or I think Steve Hodge might be on this uh, call as well and he could definitely speak to that um, from We Ride Australia. But um, look, when helmet law was introduced in Australia, we saw a precipitous decline in cycling participation. We also saw a decline in road trauma. 
Now, the two are linked. If you've got less cyclists, you have less road trauma. But um, look, no doubt, helmets save lives. And if you're a cyclist, I strongly encourage you to, to use a bike, a, a bike helmet. Um, they're great in the sun, etc. But they don't do their best work in low volume, low, um, low speed environments where cyclists are just trundling along. They don't do their best work when you're going along the creek with your kids. Um, they don't do their best work in those situations. And in fact, helmets are not really necessary in those, those situations. Uh, there will be jurisdictions who will move soon, I think, on a, a relaxation. I think it'll be the Northern Territory first and then some progressive government somewhere else will start to unlock um, helmet law, not for children, but for adults in certain circumstances. And I do think we'll see an unwinding of the position and it'll be the health economists starting to really do that for us. As I think the health benefits of increased physical activity and participation in cycling probably outweigh the road trauma. And this is from someone who lost a sister to a car accident, so, or a car crash, it wasn't really an accident. So um, I think that's how it will play out over time. Um, it's gonna take a long time to unlock though, I think. Did you want me very quickly to say two words? So my the holy grail is getting to a point where um, um, the design of infrastructure is such that helmets are a moot point. So I'm not going to waste my uh, advocacy breath uh, on helmets until we've got to a point where there is adequate investment in infrastructure, proper design uh, in an urban context, around uh, active mobility uh, and then helmets will become a moot point. So don't uh, disagree with any of Matt's points. I wear a helmet when I'm riding, uh, as most of us do. Uh, no helmets is not the answer until we've addressed some of the, the uh, other significant issues around this debate. And that's why I just don't go there and why I raise my hands in horror every time I'm asked about helmets. Wait, sorry, could I say something? Uh, actually, we don't really have time. I'm really sorry to Oh, it's all right. <laughs> just one sentence. I was just concerning about the declining rates of cycling because of helmet law that makes people less safe because there's less bikes on the street and cars are less used to bike. I never ride with a helmet, so um, I don't think I agree with this law. It's like people can choose to wear one, but it's punishing the people that don't choose to wear one. Like I got harassed by police of several yeah, times and I don't think yeah, that's so, so I think the issues, yeah, I think you're right in, in terms of the issues. And I think we've explored, the issues have been really well explored in the chat session. Um, and, and it is a controversial, it is a controversial law at the moment. Um, I'm going to keep moving. We're at 7.06, we were due to wrap up at, at seven o'clock. So thank you for those of you who've stayed on, particularly our presenters who have stayed on a bit late. Um, it's obviously lots and lots of things to be talked that we want to be talking about um, in this space. Um, I've just I've got eight new eight new questions down here. I'm going to see if I can pick up a couple that are very active travel related around, particularly for active travel. I'm focusing on here with the questions. Um, there's some stuff around bus timetables, but I think we might do that on another day. Uh, and light rail. Uh, I think that there was a question really around families, children. I think this might be our last question around families and children and drop-offs and convenience. There's been a bit of a discussion about that in the chat panel. Um, Jennifer, are you still here? Not sure if Jennifer's still with us. I think she had to go. But um, child so I might throw it to you that just to see what you think, and I'll also come back to Ben and Anne if that's okay after this. Yeah. But what you think are some of the solutions moving forward in terms of selling the active travel message yeah. to families? Yeah. That's right. So uh, in Brisbane, we have the nation's best active school travel programs. They should just simply be replicated across the, the country. Gamified interventions where child versus child class versus class, year level versus year level, school versus school are all fighting for completely meaningless prizes like a gold spray painted shoe nailed to a piece of wood and called the Golden Boot Award. Um, and we work with parents uh, to get that behaviour change and that thinking change. 
the whole conception of what is a good parent, changing that conception. So it's not the child who, um, the, the parent who turns their child into a battery hen and locks them in the back seat of the car. It's the parent who turns their child into a free range hen and gives them slowly licenses for independence and works with them to safely start to travel independently. And there are all sorts of benefits which come with this. The latest, the educationalists are telling us, is that kids that walk and cycle to school learn better and have strikingly better test scores. So, um, you know, let's do that. The other solutions to drop-offs, diversifying them. So getting kids to be dropped off 200 metres, 300 metres, 400 metres from the school gate, which really diffuses that recreation of the D-Day landings in front of the school gate itself, uh, so that we don't have that major road safety issue at that location. That, that is been worked to great effect in Queensland. And uh, you can read my research if you want to Google me, my name and private schools. You can see my views on why private schools are really problematic for active travel. But that's, that's a fight for another day. Thank you, uh, Matthew. I might just throw for the last um, response to Anne or to Ben, um, just to talk a little bit about what is happening in that space in the ACT. Yeah, I'll start quickly. We, we, ACT like to throw its hat in the ring for one of the better school programs in the country as well, Matt. So we'll have that debate. Yeah. No, I should have said you have a good one. So yeah, we, 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 uh, we you started, are quite good. And we the we awards. <laughs> we um, we started working on this um, in a really targeted fashion probably about five or six years ago on the Active Streets program and we, we went into the homes of families to understand why they were making decisions about the way their children travelled to and from school and as Matt said, it's not about the kids the kids want to walk and ride, they want to be with their friends out, out in the open um, as early as they can, I know my boys um, they'd, they'd be at school an hour early if they could be but um, it's the parents who, who are making poor choices and and they were making poor choices based primarily on perceptions, not reality. And so when we identified that as the problem, we designed the, 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 the programs around influencing how the parents um, perceived uh, and understood risk for their children. Uh, and then we implemented programs in the schools and through the students to take home to influence their parents and their parents making their choices. So we picked up that point Matt made really, really early and, and tried to use the, ch the children to influence their parents' decision making by demonstrating that um, it was actually really safe. Our statistics tell us that our school zones, um, yep, 40 k's might not be slow enough, but um, our school zones are, are the safest parts of our road network although the perception is very different because of the amount of cars there that are concentrated over short periods of time. But um, I don't know, and you might have uh, a few of the details to add, but those partway drop-off car parks, all of those things, each of our schools has a, as a as an active travel plan effectively designed for them um, and all the materials are provided for them to then deliver into their school communities. The other key decision that government made recently was around school crossing supervisors and that program has been widely successful in increasing participation but also uh, reducing that perceived safety issue that parents have. But yeah, and anything else you'd like to add? Oh, I was going to make an observation about um, uh, uh, the as schools opened up again, um, that's when we saw the um, the traffic. So, so um, as the as the the COVID emergency um, eased, um, that's where we saw that car um, the, the the traffic volumes spike. Um, so, so that does bring home that issue about non-local um, travel and, and that's really the thing that I was, I've been trying to emphasise, I hope I got that point across, um, and it goes to that question earlier about, um, about what we can affect. Um, the more local trips that we can convert, um, if schools are living, if, if children are, are schooling, um, are going to schools in their local communities, that opportunity is much, much greater. Um, when we accept as a norm that we drive across town um, to to drop children um, at school, that's, you know, that's that's a, a significant challenge. Um, and that was represented in that, that data. So um, when we think about living locally, um, schooling choices will be part of that. Great, thank you, Anne. Thanks, Ben. Um, 
Great. Well, it's quarter past seven nearly. Thank you, everybody, for um, coming along this evening. It's been a really interesting discussion. I feel like it probably could have run for about twice the length. Um, certainly, some of our speakers were... Um, I'm, I'm so sorry to have rushed you, but it was, a, it was a great discussion. And maybe we can revisit some of these topics in a little bit more detail further down the track. Um, so I'd like to say thank, um, thank you particularly to Associate Professor Matthew Burke from Griffith University, Dr. Jennifer Kent, who's from um, Sydney Univ University of Sydney, I think she's actually had to go, um, and also to Ben McHugh from um, TCCS, and to Anne Napier, who is an um, active travel, um, I'm not quite sure what your formal job title is, an active travel guru from TCCS. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time this evening. We really appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who came along and for the very, um, the very vibrant conversation in the chat bar. I'm wondering if one of my staff can cut and paste that conversation from the chat bar into a document so that we can go through those questions and those ideas that people were discussing. Um, it's really great to see you all here. I feel sometimes that we have more participation in some of these online events because we're all snuggled up at home and it works quite well for us. But the other thing it does for us is it keeps us out of our cars um, and reduces our emissions if we're not going anywhere. So there you go. There's another upside to it. Um, just a quick another reminder, Paul did put the link to the, um, the World Environment Day auction in the chat bar. So if you haven't found it yet, it's there, but you can also find it on our website. Um, so once again, thank you everybody for coming along. I will end the meeting, but please feel free to send through any other questions. We are hoping that we will be able to put a copy of this presentation onto um, the website or a link from it to the website. Um, after we've checked with our presenters that they're happy for that to happen. So if you do know somebody who might have missed tonight's discussion but would like to catch up with it later, please do check the website and we'll also put a link in the newsletter soon so you can follow that. Great, thanks again.